Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And in today's lecture, lecture 12, we're going to be looking at the new calculus integral, the definition of the integral in the new calculus, the first and only rigorous formulation of calculus in human history. Now, in order to understand this chapter or this lecture a little bit better, you should go back and re review the arithmetic mean and also the mean value theorem. Because, you know, the new calculus uh, is formulated on the mean value theorem. In fact, uh, the simplicity and the beauty of the mean value theorem seems <clears throat> the natural place to define the derivative as well as the integral. And that's why they're related. And I was the first to see that. Uh, throughout history, the academic morons who came before me could only see uh, the, the mean value theorem as an important theorem, but they never understood uh, why it is so important. And I reveal to you in lecture seven and lecture nine the reasons why, and also why it is logical to define the derivative in terms of the mean value theorem. Okay? Now, uh, not only does the mean value theorem help you to make these two definitions, but it also helps you to well define these concepts in calculus. And the mean value theorem also helps you to determine inflection points and points that are not inflection points, because in order for the mean value theorem to apply, in most cases, uh, there cannot be uh, in, in, uh, there cannot be an inflection point for the derivative. Uh, so, so the only difference in the new calculus and the old calculus and the flawed calculus in this uh, particular regard is that in the flawed calculus, you imagine there's a derivative there, but there isn't because there's no tangent line at any point of inflection. So, the cubic doesn't have a derivative. At the, at the origin. Neither does sine x at every multiple of pi. Okay, so now while you can find the general de derivative in the new calculus, it doesn't mean anything to plug in that particular x coordinate because there is no tangent line there. Okay, let's begin. Now, in this chapter, we're going to look at the new calculus integral. Let's go there. So the most important uh, things, as I've just mentioned, are the mean value theorem and how we formulate the new calculus derivative from it. Now, uh, it makes sense to use the new calculus definition because it also immediately shows the connection between the integral and the derivative in the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is derived in one step from the mean value theorem. So you normally see, uh, well, this is, uh, you don't normally see the mean value theorem like that, but this is a version of the mean value theorem, okay? And that's how the new calculus derivative is defined. Of course, you don't see the auxiliary equation here, but you can add it in. You can just say it's this plus Q of X M N. But of course, Q of X M N is always zero. So it doesn't matter whether you include it there or not, unless you're trying to find the auxiliary equation, a feature that you cannot use at all in your bogus calculus because it's ill-formed. Okay, so now uh, the integral works the same way. Uh, we simply take a given interval, divide it into equal partitions, as I've shown you in this particular diagram and you've seen before, where the slopes, uh, the slopes of the tangent lines are actually the derivative, or actually the function of the derivative, right? So this slope is usually equal to the y-ordinate length of f prime of x. And the mu's that you see here are actually the mean values or the y-ordinate lengths in that interval that are the arithmetic mean of all the ordinates in a particular given interval. So it's true for any of the mu's, okay? And they needn't be in the middle. They just are located at a position where the arithmetic mean is located. These stand for 
the x coordinate okay so when you see the mu's they stand for the x coordinate now uh, we will prove shortly that this we will prove shortly that f prime of c is equal to this and then it is required to prove the arithmetic mean of the gradients of the purple tangent lines is equal to the gradients of the blue tangent line at c uh, for the derivative function and it's also equal to the gradient of the secant, the red secant line. Now, if there were a mean abscissa us, and by the way, you can see all this in the document, so don't worry about pausing and going back. You, you have a link to my free ebook and you can access it there. So if there were a mean abscissa mu s in each of the intervals, then for the same mu s, we must have f prime of mu s such that this is true. And we know that this is true because we've already defined it in the previous chapter. This is still the definition of the derivative in the new calculus, okay? So this follows from the fact that the arithmetic mean of the arithmetic means of all the subintervals will be f prime of c. And from this we realize a new theorem. And the new theorem basically states this, this particular identity here, that if we take the mean of all the uh, f primes of the mu's, and, and that will give us the, the uh, slope of the red secant line, okay? So this is always true. It doesn't matter how many mu's you use. You could just take the one mu or two mu's or three mu's, and it will always produce the same uh, mean, right? So, and so the new, the new calculus integral, or really the arithmetic mean of all, we're not there yet. We're not at the definition of the new calculus integral yet, but pretty close. This here on the left-hand side will give you the arithmetic mean, okay? Because we simply sum up all these uh, ordinates, y ordinates of the derivative, and we divide them by the total, which is k. And notice here that there's no need for infinity or anything like that because these abscesses are the x coordinate of the arithmetic means in those sub-intervals, okay? So now you can expand this here uh, on, so that on the right-hand side so that you get an expression like this, right? And you can see this in the book. And ultimately, this is also a telescoping sum which reduces to the derivative, as you see over here, f prime of c. And so it is proven that f prime of c is equal to this value here, which is really an arithmetic mean, okay? now. Note that it does not matter what k we choose because the arithmetic mean is always the same. I've already mentioned that. Thus, for the purposes of quadrature, the seemingly impossible task of finding the arithmetic mean of innumerably many y ordinates is accomplished by a reducible telescoping sum. And I revealed that f prime of c is equal to this, which is an expression uh, in the bogus calculus for some c such that this uh, expression here will give us the area, okay? It's just the arithmetic mean of all the vertical line lengths in that interval divide, uh, multiplied by the uh, interval width, okay? M plus N is really the in interval width. So it's the, the integral is really just a product of two arithmetic means. And all integrals, definite integrals, are just a product of two arithmetic means. There is no need for infinity or limits or any of that nonsense okay so i'm just showing you using the mainstream uh, uh, notation what it is equivalent to in the new calculus and actually it's the same in the mainstream calculus except that the morons who came before me didn't know these things so uh, the new calculus integral is equivalent to the mainstream and it's stated as follows this part here is the new calculus integral and it's it's corresponding uh, its uh, corresponding definition in the mainstream calculus is listed here, right? Is shown here. So, um, misguided mainstream theory states that f prime of c is equal to that, and it has a definition like this, uh, which I think you can find on MathWorld uh, Wolfram, which is supposedly meant to show the relationship. However, uh, if you expand this, it gives you f of x minus f of a, which is not equal to f of x. So this kind of nonsense and this kind of rot that you see in front of you here just 
confirms that mainstream academics have never actually understood calculus because they've never understood the mean value theorem. Okay, and everything is based on the mean value theorem. Without it, you don't have calculus. Okay, everything else, such as inflection points, concavity, uh, you name it, you need the mean value theorem. Now, how can you blame mainstream academics who have never understood calculus or the reasons why it works? Well, we evaluate integrals by using the mean value theorem in one of two ways. We use the relationship between the primitive function and its derivative as stated in the fundamental theorem, and it's derived in one step, or we use the fact that an integral is a product of two arithmetic means to calculate a rational number approximation. That's all we ever do. So for example, if you're ca calculating the area under the bell curve um, for the normal distribution, that's all you're doing. You're, you're, you're thinking of it as a definite integral, as a finite area. You're not thinking of it as the entire area because you cannot measure the entire area. We know that the limit uh, reaches a certain irrational or incommensurable magnitude. And hence, all we can really do is just have a rational number approximation accurate to five digits, which means it's never accurate because it can't be accurate uh, unless it's a measure. And I don't mean partial measure, I mean a complete measure. So when you find uh, improper integrals, they, they are really just limits, okay? But they're still based on the fact that an integral is a product of two arithmetic means. And your Riemann integral definition actually can be shown to be a product of two arithmetic means. It's too bad that Riemann didn't see that. So the new calculus integral can be used both theoretically and practically. Now, uh, let's see how we can derive the arc length formula using the new calculus. So in the graphic that follows, I've already mentioned, the, the, I've already mentioned this, the mu's are the abscesses or x coordinates of uh, the mean value in each subinterval, okay? As you see in this diagram again. So to find the arc length, we use the distance formula for the segments that join the endpoints of each partition. In other words, the these segments from this point to this point, this point to this point, and so on, all right? And this is what you have. This is true by the distance formula, isn't it? So this, So we can actually take this out as a common factor, leaving us with this, because if we multiply this back in again, this cancels out and we come back to what we had, right? But isn't, and then of course we can take this uh, expression right out, okay? And if we take this expression right out, we end up with this. And isn't this just F prime of mu S? Of course it is. So S K, which is a distance, is equal to M plus N, over k times this radical, right? And so, uh, by the new calculus integral definition, we need the sum of all of those from one, from zero to uh, from one to k or zero to k minus one, which is equivalent, as I've shown you earlier, to this mainstream definition. And of course, that here, this expression here, is a desired result. And you can check this. Um, to see how it's done in the main, mainstream calculus, which is very confusing and doesn't make much sense at all. But in the new calculus, the differentials dy and dx are well-defined as you can see them here for each partition. Um, so the best way to look at this is with an actual example. So the arc length of the function x squared is given by this expression here. So next we find the arithmetic mean of all the segment lengths by integrating the distance formula obtained and that's possible because of the mean value theorem, isn't it? We're not pulling anything out of thin air here. So this is a finite sum found using the mean of each equal partition or subinterval. Thus the arc length is given if we let h prime of x equal to this so that this expression here is what we're looking for, isn't it? Therefore, h of x is equal to this particular function and uh, we set m plus n equal to two because that's the interval width and we calculate the sum for k is equal to one, but it will work for any other k. It will work for k is equal to two, three, four, five, it doesn't matter. But in every case, it's finite. There is no limit theory, infinity or infinitesimals. And 
just a little quick note here before the next chapter, which I'm not going to cover in this lecture. In the new calculus, every function has a closed form antiderivative or primitive function, which is only possible using the Gabriel polynomial. I will give you an introduction to the Gabriel polynomial in the next lecture, hopefully. Now, we find mu s, mu sub s as follows. And it's simply really the application of the mean value theorem. And we can check that that value is correct by solving this so that mu sub zero is equal to 1.04859. And of course, we can take that value of x, plug it in there, and we can find the arc length. Remarkably, <laughs> in a finite number of steps, you cannot do this with your bogus calculus. And no one in the history of man has ever thought of this before me. I was the first, and I'm sharing this with you. Of course, I've shared it before in other articles, but they've been shouted down just as I've been shouted down by being called a crank and a psychopath and what have you, but never mind. So you can see the graphs in the following figure, and all this is in your ebook, the free ebook. And uh, you can see the correspondence between the new calculus integral and the bogus mainstream calculus. Okay, so this is the correct formulation based on the mean value theorem, just as the derivative in the new calculus is based on the mean value theorem. And the connection is clear. There's no need to take a six months course on, course on real analysis and learn all that bullshit, excuse my language. And uh, nothing about different levels of infinity and countable sets and all that rot, okay? So, um, <clears throat> so I've shown you a way how you can obtain the mainstream integral from the new calculus integral using only an x substitution for ms. So you just simply replace your mu s and you get the new calculus integral discarding this part here, right? So this substitution property is true for any function, not just the distance function. Given that the mean value theorem is used, the finite sum is always equal to the arc length regardless of the value in the summit, that is k. Now, from this information, you can derive Green's theorem, the divergence theorem, which uses vectors and has a parametric form in the integral, and you can do a lot more. Right, now, the purpose of these two chapters, and I'm not gonna cover this one now, but the purpose of these two chapters was to show you how simple it is to derive the definitions in the new calculus. And someone with a high school education can learn these things in a matter of weeks. Now, of course, uh, if someone has taken calculus, they'll probably be able to understand these connections or these links better, but they don't have to have these links. As you see, I've simply put this in here because I know a lot of mathematics professors and researchers actually are studying my work and I want to show them what is the connection between the rot they've learned and the new calculus. So, um, so far, we've covered just about every chapter except the last chapter, which is the Gabriel polynomial. And uh, <laughs> I will only give you an introduction to this in the next le lecture and show you a few examples, hopefully. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm terribly out of breath right now. <sighs> and uh, it's a beautiful theorem, it's a closed form, uh, a method to find the closed form. Uh, of any particular function, even the integral. And that's why in the new calculus, every function is systematically integral. Um, I do make a reference here to formula T1 on page 24 of how we got calculus. This document is available on my Google Drive. It's a 24 page article on how we got calculus. Uh, it's all mainstream calculus and it would benefit you to read that if you already know calculus because you'll learn a lot you didn't know. In fact, you'll learn more there than you learned in all your three years at university and at school. So um, I'll cover the Gabriel polynomial in another lecture. This is the New Calculus Channel. My name is John Gabriel. Till next time, goodbye.